Brian Barnett is just a regular guy. He's not a doctor. He has no legal license in any field of mental or emotional health. Brian Barnett merely shares the insights he's gained from his personal experiences for anybody who may choose to use such information as he or she personally chooses, while accepting full responsibility for his or her own individual thoughts, feelings, behaviors, and actions. Brian Barnett assumes no responsibility whatsoever for anybody's individual choice to expose himself or herself to any information that Brian Barnett shares, and by listening to this program, you're acknowledging that you, and only you, are responsible for your own thoughts, feelings, and actions. Happy Thursday, everybody. Welcome back to The Last Symptom. I'm Brian Barnett, the creator and host of The Last Symptom. Really glad to have you back, my friends. And yes, I do consider those of you who are regular, regular our listeners, my friends. And I uh, want to say welcome to any of you folks who are uh, tuning in for the first time this week. I hope that uh, we'll discuss a lot of interesting things that'll prompt your curiosity and perhaps send you looking into the uh, vault of episodes to see what else you can discover come on in here and let's spend about an hour together before we get started on our real topics of discussion this week let's uh, do the announcements that way they're they're out of the way we don't have to worry about them no more and I'm going to keep it real brief this week the last symptom dot com it's my website full of free and paid resources everything you need is right over there so why don't you run over to thelastsymptom.com uh, catch up to my backstory look under the tab that says paid resources see if there's anything in there that looks appealing to you that I might be able to help you with look under the tab that says free resources and uh, see if there's anything interesting in there that you think could benefit you or somebody that you care about and that's it that's all I'm going to say for announcements this week I wanted to ask you a question it's a question that uh, well ain't a bad idea for all of us to ask ourselves this question from time to time where is your emphasis where's your emphasis the reason why I mention this is that last week we spent the hour talking about a lot of good qualities love was a big one empathy was one uh, kindness was one patience we talked about for a while and uh, there was a lot to um, chew on and meditate on and think about and unwrap in that episode involving all these great quality qualities now one mistake that a brand new listener might make listen to that episode last week's episode after hearing me talk about all those things might think wow this guy he's mastered all of these great qualities or um, boy this guy he really thinks that he's got all these qualities mastered well I wanted to tell you that's not the case uh, I, I don't I have not mastered all of those really tremendously wonderful qualities but I will tell you this I have mastered them to a level that I never in my life thought was possible before I recovered from my emotional disorder which was borderline personality disorder there was a time I think I've mentioned this in the past where I thought that no matter how hard I tried it was all a waste of my time to try to fight against these negative qualities and and to be honest with you given my approach to the thing it was a waste of time but let me tell you why I thought that the reason I thought that was because I had been raised with a father who 
never improved his bag quality, such as impatience, anger, um, selfishness, um, a tendency to look outward all the time and blame everybody else for his problems, um, and abuse, abusive behaviors, behaviors such as uh, tearing a person down, you know, verbally, just so that emotionally you were just spent and hating yourself all, all the next day and for the whole week and, and those sorts of things. The way I grew up was my father knew those things were not right. And there was a part of him that um, felt tremendous, tremendously bad about those things. I mean, he knew that it was not a good way to treat his family. But shame, you know, shame was the overriding thing. It was always shame. You know, the reason why why he treated us that way was because of shame. And then uh, after he would get done and he would think about uh, how he had treated us and stuff, I know he was ate up with just more shame. Now you understand why I say that people who feel shameful do shameful things. It's a it's a vicious cycle. It's a vicious wheel. Whenever you feel sh- shameful about yourself, you will do shameful things. And then afterwards, when you're thinking about how much you hate yourself for having done those things, it just feeds more shame. Uh, and that's that vicious cycle. That's why shame is never constructive the reason why I'm getting off on a tangent here about this is because he would come into my bedroom hours later or maybe even the next day and he would sit down and he'd say boy I'm sorry about that I'm sorry about the way I behaved I'm sorry about all that I need to to do better and then a, a week would pass and he would do the same thing all over again and I watched this this play out for 20 years. For 20 years I watched this play out. He never got better. Often he got worse. And uh, so when I turned into an adult and I went out into my adult life and then suddenly now I'm behaving in these same ways. Of course, I thought back to the only example in my life that I had. I had a person who swore up and down he was going to try harder. He was going to try harder. He needed to do better and never did. Never did. Never accomplished it. So that was the, uh, that was what I was working with in my own head was that no matter how hard I try, it's a waste of time. No matter how hard I hate treating people this way, it's a waste of time because it's only a matter of time. I can only white knuckle it for so long before eventually I will mistreat people again. Well, without going into the whole big thing here this week, the reason long-term listeners will already know why I, I couldn't get anywhere, why my father couldn't get anywhere, is because it, did, it never occurred to either one of us to get back to the fundamental causes of where these things were coming from and trying to understand those and identifying the thinking, the attitudes, the perspectives that were allowing us to behave in those ways, to interpret people's uh, interactions with us in such an offensive affront to us and those sorts of things and eliminate those things so that then, you know, we didn't have to go around trying not to mistreat people. We just didn't mistreat people because then the the underlying causes of the things fueling all that and prompting all that were gone. Um, so, yes, my original, the way that I originally perceived uh, the thing was bound. I was always bound for failure in that, with that uh, pr- those perspectives, that understanding of how to handle the situation. But. Once I removed those boundaries, that those erroneous th- ways of thinking, that unhealthy, flawed approach, uh, then, uh, and I removed all those obstacles, then my ability to begin to truly develop these good and healthy qualities started. And uh, now it's been about a decade 
more or less that I've been slowly inching along and developing these qualities and I'm at a place where like I said from from before when I had borderline personality disorder looking ahead and thinking about (laughs) me not behaving in those ways and not treating people in those ways and being a better person and just thinking it was impossible well I'm there now I am there now so although I have not mastered all of those good qualities I am far beyond a place where I ever thought would be possible let's talk a minute for uh, about what it would mean if I were if I were masterfully applying all these good qualities and had adopted all these good qualities to their full potential what would that mean necessarily it would mean that I was I would be a perfect person right so is it attainable for us ever to develop those qualities in this world to a perfect degree no so it's not a matter of it's not it's not like once you become emotionally healthy suddenly you are you have mastered all good qualities to a to their um, full potential that's not what being healthy is you're still going to make mistakes remember we're all dealing with two ongoing things if we have an emotional disorder we're dealing with two two ongoing things that's the emotional disorder and then there's the human condition when you get healthy the emotional disorder is gone but you will always be dealing with the human condition and that just includes things like flubbing up making mistakes. I think we're going to talk later today about a big flub that I made uh, just a week or so ago and I know you folks love hearing when I mess up and uh, how I handle that ha- handle such a thing so I'll share something with you that with you a little bit later so we're getting off a little bit here but um, last week we talked about for example that all good qualities are interlinked you can't develop for example kindness in the total absence of patience and what's that mean it means you got to develop patience right along with kindness well what else does kindness and patience require empathy so there's three things you got to develop all simultaneously or together and I was trying to give an example last week I don't know how many of you understood the illustration I was trying to give to to illustrate it but uh, I was thinking of a tank that has different like a water tank that has different chambers and as you're filling up the water tank with uh, water, those chambers all fill up all together, all, all at the same time. Um, and I, I haven't thought of a better way to describe that, but I, I think you know what, kind of what I'm referring to. Another illustration would be like a, a swimming pool, like an inflatable swimming pool. You know, it has different chambers in the, in the swimming pool. Shh, 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 as you're blowing that sucker up it's not like one chamber fills up then another chamber fills up and then another chamber fills up it's not generally how it works the way it works is that all of the chambers slowly the whole pool and all the chambers equally begin to fill up together and so that's that's what I in my experience it was it has been like me developing uh, qualities like love patience kindness Uh, I'm working on them all together I'm trying to be mindful of them all together and as I'm strengthening one well then another one becomes easier for me to apply and it also strengthens and as I'm strengthening that one and it's becoming easier to apply another one is becoming easier to apply so for example let's just go with patience and kindness think about how much patience is required for kindness because patience is a kindness right so think about how you're trying you're, you're saying to yourself I want to I want to be a, a more kind person I want to be kinder I want to adopt that quality as your focus of focusing on being kind you're also focusing on your treatment of others your treatment of yourself and and in fact it it begins with yourself doesn't it it's nice to be kind to other people but um you have more opportunities to interact with and deal with yourself a- ain't that true 
you're with yourself every day and all and always in, in every circumstance if you're looking for somebody to practice being kind with there you are right so it all starts with us that's where we get our practice being kind and patient with ourselves so we we demonstrate some kindness to ourselves and that necessarily has to involve patience doesn't it so do you see how as you're working on being kind your patience necessarily has to be getting better and strengthened as well because you can't have one without the other and we also talked about how motives for example motives are in one of the ingredients so even if you're just going through the steps of doing kind things uh, demonstrating patience but your motives are not the correct motives then that's not true kindness and that's not true patience is it so th- think about this a kindness isn't kindness if I'm doing a thing primarily for my own benefit let's say in my interactions with other people in this case so in my interactions with you for example if I'm going through the motions of demonstrating a kindness to you but my motive for it is primarily for my own benefit and I'm simply using you as a tool to get there that's not kindness is it my primary motives are relevant they are a big ingredient for whether the the end product truly is that quality or not love isn't love in the absence of the right underlying motives as well as the absence of other good qualities like peace goodness think about a a home as we're talking about this homes of uh, let's say the people you grew up with you know when you were growing up you probably spent a lot of time in other people's homes in your own home So think about a home where there's an absence of qualities like peace, goodness, mildness, self-control, and joy. Just chaos. People mistreating each other, abusing each other, saying terrible things to each other, selfishly only looking after their own interests. And then you begin to see why it's so ridiculous that these homes that are completely ruled by disorder, anger, selfishness, abuse, strife. Why it's so ridiculous to see these folks talk about how much they quote-unquote love each other. Remember last week we talked about the only reason why people can live lives that are so contradictory to love and still say, but I love you. And why is that? Because they believe that love is a feeling. It's just what they feel. Whatever they feel is what determines whether that's love or not. And that's not true because love is not a feeling. It's a quality. If you want a a very in-depth discussion about why that's true, listen to the previous episode. What about uh, self-control? Self-control is a pretty nice quality, ain't it? But... Is self-control just the act of controlling yourself? No. What else does it need? What else does it need other than just the, the act of going through the motions of controlling yourself for it to be a quality? The motivating force. What is motivating me? Why, what is inspiring me to demonstrate self-control? You see, that's just as important so I I can tell you that in examples of uh, my dealings with my daughter it's love love is is what's uh, causing me to uh, to have a desire to demonstrate those other qualities at all so they're all interconnected but back to the the discussion here about where's your emphasis remember I did not mention to you last week that that I I haven't mastered these completely 
it goes without saying that I haven't mastered them completely because I'm not a perfect person, but I mean, it's worth pointing out that yeah, nobody, nobody in this world can master those qualities because they would, it would mean you were perfect. And so that's unattainable. But it goes back to this conversation about where's your emphasis? Where's my emphasis? Is my emphasis on all that I have not done? Is my emphasis on all that I would still like to improve upon? Well, if my emphasis were there, then surely that would have popped into my head and I would have driven that into the ground, wouldn't I? I would have told you over and over again about how I have not mastered these things. Gosh, there's so much left for me to do. And boy, I make so many mistakes and, and all that. But because my emphasis is not on that, what is my emphasis on? My emphasis, again, is on the incredible progress that I have made and that I continue to fine tune. Remember, I, I'm at a place I never thought was possible. I can't emphasize that enough. I never thought it was possible. Again, I, I had my father's example. I knew he was trying. He was trying. But he was white knuckle trying. He was just fighting against natural consequences of his thinking and attitudes. But he never looked back and analyzed and addressed and fixed the the attitudes and the perspectives. So it's like a water hose, right? Like whatever you turn on, whatever faucet you got that water hose connected to, that is what is going to come through the water hose. Let's let's use this example. Clean water and contaminated water. There's a good example. If you've got your water hose connected to a faucet of contaminated water, it doesn't matter how much you will clean water to come out the other end of that water hose, that's impossible. And do you know what will happen if you tie off that water hose and just leave it there? Let's say you tie it off so that the water isn't flowing out the end of the hose. And it's connected to that contaminated water source. What will happen? The hose will wear out and it will spring leaks. It will. And what will come out of the water hose? Clean water? Absolutely not. Contaminated water. This is exactly what we're talking about when I tell you that whatever your behaviors and your, your actions, your feelings, your thoughts, these are a direct product this is exa- this is the water flows flowing through the hose what is the uh, the water faucet that the hose is connected to that's your underlying attitudes it's your underlying perspectives it's it's all these fundamental notions of life feelings and self that you have been educated with and that you're living with whatever that is that's what's going to flow through the hose. So when you think about a person who is simply white knuckle trying to control their behaviors, but they ha- they have not gone back to the source of those behaviors, the source, the fundamental thinking and attitudes that give birth to those behaviors, what are they doing? They're just tying off the, they're just trying to tie off the end of the the water hose. But the source of the water is still what it is, right? Uh, And the water hose will spring a leak. If you turn, if you untie the water hose and you let the water flow, what's going to come out is the, the rusty, contaminated, nasty water because it, that's all that can come out of the water hose. So what do you got to do in that illustration? Well, you got to disconnect the water hose from the source, right? The contaminated source. You got to move it over and reconnect it. <coughs> screw that baby in to now a the the clean water source. The water faucet or the water spout that is the source of clean water 
And once you do that, now what just naturally flows through the water hose? Clean water. That's the, the type of situation we're talking about here. That's why I say that when you start getting healthy, you're not walking around white knuckling your behaviors and that sort of thing. Why not? Because you have, you have gotten rid of that source, the source of those behaviors, the source of those think that type of thinking, the source of those types of attitudes. And you've gone over to a new attitude system, a new perspective system. And now the natural behaviors, the natural thinking, the natural feelings that flow through that water hose are just naturally what they are. Healthy, healthy thinking, healthy behaviors. Because the fundamental source of where all those things spring are healthy. So, my emphasis, here's something I want to tell you about your emphasis. Wherever you're putting your emphasis will have a tremendous effect on your life. What do I mean by that? Well, there's an interesting thing that happens when we're talking about emotional health and emotional issues that uh, is kind of it can kind of seem counterintuitive let me tell you what i mean by that in sports say baseball because i like baseball and i don't like other sports usually i like tennis um but let's stick with baseball in baseball let's say that a pitcher is pitching very poorly how do you fix that? How does the, the manager or the coach, does he fix that? How does he address it? Well, he tells you, you're, you're doing a lousy job. <laughs> That's how he fixes it. You, as a pitcher in sports, knowing that you're doing a lousy job, what does that cause you to do? It causes you to try harder, doesn't it? That is the way it works in sports. I'm sure it's the same in football and everything else. You say to a, a linebacker or something, you're doing a terrible job. You're doing a terrible job. Well, that guy says, well, I don't want to lose my spot uh, on the team, so I'm going to try even harder. And, boy, he hunkers down, and he just tries harder than he's ever tried before in his life, right? I'm sure, I'm sure it's let that way with every sport. That makes sense. and That's typically the way we think of things. It's got to be handled that way, right? If, if you... If you're hard on a person, then that will cause them to try harder and they'll do better. But when we're talking about emotional health and emotional issues, it don't, it don't work like that. It works the opposite. And I'll tell you why. The reason it works the opposite is because emotional unhealth or emotional disorder is built on shame already. You remember that wheel I told you about with my father? already feels he already feels like he's a piece of trash so he treats he treats other people he behaves in trashy ways and then afterwards he looks at what he's done and he's here's the mistake that unhealthy people make they don't look at the thing they've done and say that thing I did is crappy the thing I did is crappy what mistake do we make when we're unhealthy? We say, that thing I did is proof that I'm crappy. And that's shame. Catch that? Catch yourself. How often do you do that to yourself? You see, the healthy person identifies the thing as being the, the, the thing that is wrong and the thing that uh, is the problem. I did a really terrible thing. The unhealthy person doesn't. The, uh, the, other, the unhealthy person also focuses on the thing, but what do they do? Do they stop there and say, that thing is terrible? No, they don't stop there. They say, that thing that I did is proof of how terrible I am. Do you see that? It's a boomerang. We should talk, we should refer to that as the, the shame boomerang. 
Only unhealthy people throw, let's say, the shame boomerang. Healthy people don't. Healthy people, for example, if, if I do a terrible thing now because I'm healthy and I don't have borderline personality disorder and I'm not dealing with an emotional disorder anymore, now when I do a, a terrible thing, I identify the thing I did, that it was a terrible thing I did. I, it doesn't come back. The thing doesn't boomerang back to say, there's something wrong with me. That's shame. As shame is at the root of emotional disorder and emotional unhealth. So what does the unhealthy person do? They, they look at the terrible thing they did, and they say, that thing I did, and the boomerang comes right back around, proves what a terrible person I am. That thing I did, boomerang comes back around, proves that I'm a piece of uh, horse papooey. A terrible thing I did shows how worthless I am. A terrible thing I did, whoop, boomerang comes back, shows what a terrible parent I am. You see, it's all, it's all an attack on oneself. That's shame. Whereas guilt identifies the thing itself as being the problem. Why is why is guilt so healthy? Because if you when you identify the thing as the problem, it's fixable. You you can just do the thing different moving forward. But when you identify yourself as the problem, I did that terrible thing I did. Boomerang comes back, proves what a terrible person I am. You know, it's a it's a perspective, an unhealthy perspective, an attitude about your inherent condition. So when your perspective about your inherent condition is that you're the problem, um, there's nothing to fix because you will always be you. No fixing that. So when it comes to emotional health, remember we were talking about sports and how it's, uh, it's logical that when a pitcher is not pitching well, you call him out. You call him out and you tell him, you, you suck. You, you're terrible at pitching. These are all the things you need to fix. And he goes, oh, man, coach is right. I am terrible. I need to fix these things. And he hunkers down and he fixes those things. But do you remember what I told you that in, with emotionally, uh, when it comes to emotional health, it's completely the opposite. And it's completely the opposite. Why? because unhealth is already built on shame and shame already tells you that you are the problem you're the problem and if you're doing something wrong what do you identify that thing you're doing wrong as the proof that you are the problem so a funny thing happens when it comes to emotional health and we're and we emphasize the negative you know what it is i already gave you the example of my dad in matters of emotional health, the more you emphasize the negative, the more you encourage negative non-action. Let me say that again. When it comes to emotional health, the more you emphasize the negative, the more you encourage negative non-action, such as lack of care and a lack of effort. See how it's, it's entirely different from things like sports and that sort of thing. In sports, when you emphasize the negative, the tennis player or the baseball player says, "Man, I gotta get, I gotta really hunker down on this and uh, and improve this." So they try even harder, they work even harder, and yes, they improve. But in matters of emotional health, because it's all built upon a foundation of shame, the opposite happens. When you point out and emphasize the negative to a person, that only encourages negative non-action. Non-action, in other words, a complete failure to even have the desire to act, lack of care and lack of effort but what happens when you emphasize the positive so there are all these negative things 
But what happens when you say, uh, let's not emphasize all those negative things. Let's instead look for the good things and emphasize those. Then what happens? Exactly the opposite of what happens in sports and these other things. So think about, again, the pitcher in baseball. He sucks. He sucks. He's doing a terrible job. He hasn't been trying enough. And the coach says, well... Yeah, there's a lot there's a lot of negative things there, but let's emphasize and focus the positive. What happens? In that setting, what happens is that the pitcher says, "Okay, well, I don't even have to try then. I'm doing fine. I'm doing fine and uh, the coach seems to be happy with me. So I'm happy with me and I don't have to try any harder than what I am." And he continues to suck and he gets even worse but not in emotional health. What happens in emotional health instead? The exact opposite. Why? Because it's built on a foundation of shame. So in emotional health, when you are trying very hard, but there's all these negative things, you're doing this wrong, you're doing that wrong, you're failing to do that, and you're failing to do this. But you choose to focus upon and emphasize the positive. So you say, I'm, I know, I do know that there's a lot of negative there that exists, but, but I'm going to kind of de-emphasize that, and I'm going to find the positive things that I'm doing and the positive things about my recovery, and I'm going to emphasize that and celebrate that. What happens? The more you emphasize the positive, the more you encourage what? positive action that's true in recovery it's true with emotional health it's counterintuitive I know but it's the truth and think about this people who are unhealthy have already been uh, punishing themselves for sometimes 50, 60, 70 years they have done their time there is nobody Punishing that can punish them more than they are already punishing themselves inside. You see, because their constant dialogue with themselves inside of themselves is, I'm worthless. And you know, you think about the, the conversation they're having with them, they're, they're saying, You, you're worthless, talking about themselves. You're worthless. You are a piece of crap. You're a piece of horse papui. You're worth, you know, you, you're inherently devoid of value. Um, they've been beating themselves to death with this message for their entire lives. Anything negative or highlighting the negative or focus upon the negative is only going to feed, it only feeds what they're already doing to themselves. They have paid their dues. So even though it's counterintuitive, in the health, in the emotional health setting, or, um, you know, with matters involved in emotional health, the counterintuitive thing is the right thing to do. De-emphasize the negative, focus upon the positive. Why? Well, I already said it. The more you emphasize the positive, the more you encourage positive action. So I think about, like, for example, a schoolgirl who's uh, bad at spelling she's bad at spelling she's insecure she's uncertain of herself she uh, already believes bad things about herself she believes that she's a terrible speller she'll never get it right she's bound for failure and now think about the teacher recognizing that in her and pulling her aside and saying you know what you spelled five words right last week. I am so impressed. I am so impressed. I have never in my life seen you do so well. Do you know that even half of the class did not spell five words right, but you did. It's amazing. It's amazing what you did last week. I'm so impressed. Good job. Now, how does that 
girl feel when she leaves the teacher and thinks about uh, the spelling homework or the spelling assignments or the spelling tests for next week you see what I'm getting at what if the teacher the girl already thinks that she's a total loss as far as spelling goes and think about the teacher going to the student and saying you know what you I don't even know why you try I don't even know why you try you're so bad at spelling and it just it's like a lost cause you know you it, you're never it seems like you're never going to get this right well good luck I'll, hopefully you'll do better next week do you think she's going to do better next week under those conditions no but when the teacher says I'm so impressed I mean the way you were your spelling lately is just incredible when that student goes away now she is primed for improvement she's animated she's excited she's encouraged that's kind of the the thing we're talking about here so where are you putting your emphasis if you've been approaching the thing like you're a baseball player or a tennis player or an accountant or I don't know what um, that's the wrong approach when, when we're talking about emotional health why just to kind of emphasize it because emotional unhealth is built on a foundation of shame and when you emphasize negative things to a person who is already uh, living on a foundation of shame the only thing you encourage is more neg negative things negative non-action a lack of caring a lack of interest a lack of enthusiasm a lack of trying so be sure that in your dealings with yourself as you're going through this process of emotional improvement uh, to emphasize the positive and don't worry that you're gonna that you're being permissive or anything like that or that you're going to encourage the wrong thing you're not why because of the shame foundation and you've already spent an entire lifetime it is already your go-to default to be critical of yourself and it's getting you nowhere the only thing that that encourages for a person who's already unhealthy is more unhealth negative focus it upon the negative only encourages more unhealth so think about my example of these qualities all the good qualities yes there are improvements I, I I'm constantly thinking about making but it, you know I'm not I'm not losing sleep about it because I'm so happy about how far I've come and I'm and I know that I'm constantly steadily <laughs> sometimes it's just inching along but it's constant and it's steady it's a constant and steady movement advancement in the right direction so why would I complain about that why would I beat myself up about what I have not yet accomplished when I'm already leaps and bounds beyond where I ever thought I would be I'm so happy I'm so happy and content with my progress and um, and it continues to go in the right direction I mean I think about where I'm at now and where um, I very realistically could be in another 10 years and it just blows my mind I mean my mind's already blown about where I'm at emotionally speaking and as far as the development of good qualities another 10 years I can't even imagine I can't even imagine so emphasize the right things folks acceptance let's just mention that for a second it goes a long way let me tell you why acceptance if you got a pencil equals relief think about that acceptance the quality equals relief why does it equal relief well I don't think people uh, think about this uh, a lot of times but um, another way of talking about acceptance is 
allowing things to be just how they are. You ever thought about that? I know I've mentioned it before, but you know, I mention a lot because when I before I was healthy, when you talk to when anybody talked to me about acceptance, I thought, well, that means that I have to like it. It means that I have to like it and embrace it like it's something that I approve of. But there's so many things I don't approve of that I accept. That's that's emotional health is accepting lots of things that you absolutely absolutely do not approve of so acceptance isn't approving of a thing it's not liking a thing it's simply your ability to look at a thing and see it for what it really is no matter how you feel about it so listen gas prices right now are really pissing me off I'll give you to you straight Every time I drive by a gas station and I see that gas is up over $5, to me that is absolutely, absolutely unacceptable. It is absolutely unacceptable. I can't believe there's a whole world of people driving around, driving past these gas sign, uh, gas pump signs with those types of prices on there and just living life like it's okay. I even see memes make making light of it, making jokes about it. Well, I don't think it's funny at all. The gas prices being what they are, I think it's an absolute outrage. So, because I hate the thing so much, I could just pretend that they aren't. They aren't there. That the gas prices are not what they are. I could pretend. I could just pretend like gas prices being what they are doesn't exist. And uh, pretend like the causes of it aren't what they are. And I could pretend like it doesn't bother me. And I could pretend like it's just fine with me and life is just fine and everything. Uh, But that's not acceptance, is it? Acceptance is me when I drive by the gas station, looking at the price of the gas and saying, that's what it is. That's what it is. And the people in control who are who they are. And there's nothing, I absolutely nothing I can do about it. And that's just the reality I'm dealing with. No matter how I feel about it, that's just the reality I'm dealing with. Do you see why acceptance can be a relief? Now, we're not talking about things involving yourself that you have the capacity to improve and that you reasonably should improve. For example, if you are an abusive person to your family, you have moral reasons to improve those things and you have the capacity to improve them. So you must. You must, if you're going to be content with yourself, square with God, and be able to consider yourself a good person you must at least be uh, doing everything you can to address and fix that that issue so we're not talking about that i'm referring to things events situations that are out of your control let's take people for example their lives their decisions things of that nature that are absolutely none of your business and are out of your control Do you see how when you develop acceptance and you're able to look at the situation of somebody living in a way that you personally don't approve of, tell you what, in today's world, uh, there's lots of people living in ways that, that I don't believe are morally right. Um, uh, but you know applying the law of individual inherent rights responsibility and authority I acknowledge their right to live however they want and so I don't lose sleep over it and I don't involve myself with it I don't treat people any different who are living uh, in ways that I don't think are morally right Um, I don't treat them any different at all because I don't view myself as a an authority on over their lives do you see how that's a relief 
a relief that I can just sit back and accept that, first of all, the person has the right to live however they want to live. Second of all, that the only person I have any authority over whatsoever is myself and my own choices and the way I choose to live. You see that? Why is it a relief? Why is this acceptance a relief? Because I'm not responsible for that stuff. I'm not responsible for your decisions, your mistakes, the things that you choose to do or you don't choose to do. Because I'm not responsible for it, and I surrender away the desire to even assume any type of responsibility over that or rights over you, because I'm willing to surrender that that false illusion away, I can just sit back and go, ah, yeah, yeah, lots of people doing things that I, I, I personally don't think are, are good or are, are right, and it's not on me, it's not my weight to carry. Um, I don't have to treat, I don't have to feel obligated to treat them any different than I treat anybody else. What a relief that is. What a relief acceptance is. It goes a long way. Remember, acceptance can be another way of saying that you're just allowing things to be whatever they are. Again, we're talking about things that are you, you have no authority over and are not in your control. So basically anything that's not you or your children. What a relief. I don't think people often realize that just allowing things to be whatever they are means that you can just sit back and do nothing. It's like watching a movie. How relaxing is going in and just watching a movie? Even if there are things on there on the screen that you go, hmm, that's, I don't agree with that. You say, yeah, but it's just a story I'm just observing. I'm just an observer of the story. It, my observing um, does not um, condone it or support it. It's just that, yeah, real life does involve those types of things. And I'm just sitting here and ah, not responsible for it. Wow, that's, that's a good feeling. I don't have to try to control it. You know, I don't have to jump up and start screaming at the screen. Hey, that's not right. That's not right. You shouldn't be doing, you shouldn't be robbing that bank. No, just sit back. Don't worry about it. Look, listen, they're choosing to rob the bank on the, on the movie screen. Just sit back. Uh, we have things in place for those sorts of things like, you know, movie uh, police officers and movie detectives. They'll take care of it. You just sit back. You just sit back and relax. Ah, what a relief. What a relief acceptance can be. Like that Beatles song, you know, let it be. What were they talking about? They're talking about acceptance. Has that ever occurred to you that that famous Beatles song, let it be, is a song about acceptance. It's just sitting back and saying it is what it is. And I don't have to try to control it. I'm not responsible for it. I'm just an observer. And when I observe the world, uh, I'm sure that you're a lot like me. When I observe the world, I want to see the true nature of the world. So... You know, that was, that's why I would go to like a movie like Schindler's List. Do you think I enjoyed... I, I'm sure I'm not the only person who did not enjoy sitting through Schindler's List. I didn't enjoy it. It was terrible. I remember in that movie, uh, I went to see it with my buddy Jordan. And uh, for those of you who don't know, Jordan was uh, my best friend who died in a car accident years ago. But Jordan, um, in that the- theater... He leaned over to me in the dark, and he at the beginning of oh not not Schindler's List, uh, Saving Private Ryan, Saving Private Ryan, which was the uh, you know, them storming the the uh, beaches of Normandy in World War II. He, he leans over and he said, Brian, Brian, your 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 grandfather was there. I said, Yeah, but how did you know that? He said, well, when, when you took me over to your grandpa's house one time, and he and I, we were just talking about World War II and Normandy, and 
and, and your grandfather stormed the beaches. He, he, he would be one of the characters here in this cast who are storming the beaches. And um, I'll, I'll just never forget that. Jordan was just infinitely impressed by that. And um, he had only met my grandpa like a handful of times. But that opening scene there in uh, Saving Private Ryan you know nowadays there's been a hundred movies made like that but when that movie come out it it was the realism of it was like nothing before and as a avid moviegoer i had seen many movies Uh, i had never seen anything that made me squirm so much in my seat like saving private ryan the them storming the beaches of normandy i wanted out of there i felt fear for my life um if there's one thing I remember about that is that what it accomplished when it first come out, like I said, it's been kind of dulled over the years because other films have come out like it. But um, what it accomplished was to really give you a sense. Of, well, let's talk about me. It really gave me a sense, uh, just a fraction of the sense of what my grandpa must have been feeling when he stormed that beach because I was just sitting in a theater and I was scared for myself and I was scared for the safety of everybody I thought how in the world is anybody going to get off this beach alive so uh, what was I going into there acceptance I don't like those sorts of things I don't take pleasure in them but when I look at the world and I study history or I I look at just real conditions in the world. I want to see it for what it really is, no matter how ugly it is. That's acceptance. I want to see it for what it truly is, not some cushioned imaginary ver- version of of the real world. Folks, have a wonderful weekend, and I'll talk to you hopefully next week. Thanks for joining me this week. Take care. Digging a hole And the walls are caving in Behind me Air's getting thin But I'm trying and breathing in Come find me It hasn't felt like this before Hasn't felt like home before you And I know it's easy to say But it's harder to feel this way And I miss you more than I should Than I thought I could Can't get my mind off you Can't get my mind off you